you are. You, like I, have come to remember. Here we are at the Jordan River, and, and I can see that you, like I, have made a choice this morning to do what God has commanded us to do. You see, we are, we are a fragile and forgetful people. But God has commanded us to remember. And so I do. I do make the choice to remember. How about you? I remember the morning dawning like this. It, 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 was, it, was a beautiful, it was a beautiful morning, early to mid-July. A semi-arid climate, it was already dry, it was already hot, and, and, and the rains had not been in, in excess that year. And as we approached Kadesh Barnea, in, in the south of what you today would call the Holy Land, we were astir with excitement. This was the land that God had promised to your great, great, great grandfather Abraham. And, and finally, we were there. Can you imagine? I mean, just 11 days earlier, we'd crossed the Red Sea. We'd seen God protect and provide as the Egyptian army had pursued us into the midst and then the waters overwhelmed them and he had protected us. And here we are as God had continued to lead us with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And now here we are at the borders of the promised land. Okay, so that's how I wish the story had gone. But it didn't go anything like that at all. Uh, uh, that's how we expected the story to go. You see, God had led us out of Egypt. And, and he had led us uh, through the Red Sea, or the Sea of Reeds. It's that, it's that extended marsh area on the north end of the, the north, south, east, west wing of the Red Sea, and indeed, the Egyptian army had followed us through. God had made a way on dry land, and then the waters had come in and overwhelmed them. Yea, God. Yea, God. He had protected us. But then the cloud of fire, rather than heading straight across the wilderness to Kadesh Barnea, made an about right-hand turn and headed south into the Sinai Peninsula. What the heck was God doing? Where was he going? I mean, 11 days and we would have been there. And I don't mind telling you that we were all more than a little bit confused. This was not, if you say it with me, this was not what we expected. It was not what we expected. You see, we, we, we had expectations when God led us out of Egypt. We had expectations of how it would go and how it would unfold. And I don't mind telling you that this unexpected direction, maybe we'll call it the indirect route to the Holy Land, the long road to the Holy Land, was fraught with challenge. It was difficult. We had water issues. You can imagine a host of people in, in a semi-arid climate, and all of a sudden we ran out of water. But God provided water. We, we had neighbor issues. Oh, it wasn't a completely unpopulated area, and we tried to avoid trouble when we could, and yet trouble seemed to find us. In fact, the Amalekites sought us out. They were descended from the Edomites of the tribe of Esau. Abraham, Isaac, his brother Esau. It was a sneak attack, and they came to obliterate us. And 
And so Moses sent me and the, the best of our troops to do battle. My name is Joshua. I was in my mid-twenties when Moses sent us to do battle. And maybe you recall the account. Moses on the hill, and as long as he kept his arms raised to God in praise, we prevailed. But when his arms grew tired, we failed. So his brother Aaron and her held his arms up, and God delivered us from this enemy. We had water issues, we had neighbor issues, we had faith issues. Uh, maybe you remember that whole golden calf debacle? It seems we had some lessons that God needed to teach us. And it was the long road, it was the indirect route that became the curriculum God used to teach and to train. We needed to learn that God loves us and he will provide even something as as basic to life as water. It was on the long road that that his curriculum included the fact that he cares for us. He's got our backs even when the enemy pulls a sneak attack. It was on the long road that we were going to bluntly encounter the fact that God is holy. Holy. And he can allow no sin in his presence. Sin can no more be in the presence of a holy God than can gasoline be in the presence of fire. Utterly incompatible. And so with that whole golden calf thing, those who were faithless to God and looked back to the gods of Egypt, they were dealt with severely. And and we learned to treat God with the awe and the respect that he is deserving of. He had more to teach us, so he gave us the Ten Commandments on the long road. And he gave us the designs for the Ark of the Covenant in which the Ten Commandments would reside. And he gave us the drawings, the designs for the tabernacle. And this would be the place of our instruction. This is where we would be reminded. We would be reminded God is holy. And we must approach him with reverence and with awe and in obedience. We had water issues. We had neighbor issues. We had faith issues. We had internal politics issues. You see, when when things didn't go as expected and the long road was more difficult than anyone anticipated, well, people began to grumble, began to complain. Even Moses' sister Miriam and his brother Aaron turned against him. But God listened to Moses when he prayed on their behalf and asked God to forgive them. God listened to Moses when he prayed on behalf of the rebellious people and and God heard Moses' prayer and forgave them. We had some things to learn on the long road, including the mercy of our God. A God who wants to respond to us, who invites us into dialogue and relationship. God listened to Moses' prayer. Egypt, Kadesh Barnea. Eleven days, or there was the long road, which took more than two years to complete. And then, finally, the morning dawned bright and clear. We were on the verge of the promised land, and as we approached Kadesh Barnea, some of the leaders among us approached Moses and said, look, I think it would be a good idea if we sent scouts to spy out the land, see what is ahead. So Moses took the question to the Lord, 
And the Lord said, go. And so 12 of us were chosen to go. One of the younger leaders from each of the 12 tribes or families of Israel would go on a 40-day adventure into the land. We would start at Kadesh Barnea in the south, and we would go up into the north. Uh, we, would, uh, we would investigate the land, was the instructions that were given. A- and once again, our expectations were challenged. In fact, in fact, not only were our expectations challenged, but our assumptions were challenged as well. What are the assumptions that you make about God? You see, here we were. We were finally where we were supposed to be, right? So surely God was going to make it simple. Surely now we were on the right path and the, the, the way would be cleared before us. Maybe you've recently begun to follow God and assume that, well, now things are just going to be easy. Pieces will fall into place. Uh, That is not the experience of the vast majority of those who have followed God. Often he leads us in difficult ways to test us. The, The way steel is tested and tempered to become stronger and more useful. Our assumptions were that we were here on the the verge of the promised land and now things would get easy. Now things would fall into place and just be smooth. Moses said, look, go into the land and observe the land. How fertile is the soil? Um, What's the nature of the people who are there? Uh, What about the cities? What about the roads? What about the pathways? Uh, Scope this place out. And so the 40 of us went, we began in the south in Kadesh Barnea, and we began to go north. 800 kilometers round trip, over 40 days. We began to go north, and we we went to Hebron, the great and ancient city. And and then we continued north past Shechem and Salem. Salem would be renamed Jerusalem in the years to come. And we continued north through the ancient city of Beth Shean and around the Sea of Galilee and then up into the hill country, staying well east of the ancient city of Damascus. And I tell you, the land was good. Like those expectations, those assumptions, what God had said was true. The land was good, it was fertile, it was lush. It was everything that God had promised and more. Those expectations were good. We we can believe what God has clearly promised. And we can trust him for that. This was a place where God's people could could grow and and multiply. Uh, We we had, had met our limits in Egypt. It was too small. But now God was taking us to the land of promise and here we could prosper as he had said we would. On our way back south, not far from Hebron, we went through the valley of Eshkol and and cut a cluster of grapes. I tell you that cluster was so enormous it had to be carried on a pole between two of us in order to get it back to camp. Well, we arrived at camp, and, and such was the testimony of Caleb and myself. But not all of the scouts who had spied out the land could see what we could see or were willing to believe God for what we believed God for. It, it was ten against two. Uh, Shimei and, and Shaphat and Agal and, 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 and the others of the ten They said, yes, the land is good, but the people are huge and they're far too strong for us. And and yes, the cities are present, but but they're fortified. You get to the city of Dan in the far north, some of the walls were 26 feet thick. How do we prevail against such formidable odds? 
How do we prevail against such obstacles? Thus was the argument. It went on and it went on. And Caleb made a valiant speech to the people. He said, we must go up. We must take the land. This is the land that God has promised to us. He's pleased with us. He will give us the victory. Do not rebel in this way against the Lord. This was our plea time and time again, so much so that the people resolved that they would kill us by throwing rocks at us, pummeling us with stones. I remember. I remember and rue the day. If it had not been for Moses' intercessory prayer for the people, God was so angry he was prepared to to destroy them all with plague for their unfaithfulness. But Moses prayed. And, And he spoke to God on behalf of the people and God relented. He took the lives of the ten faithless spies And he decreed that Caleb and I would be the only two of our generation who would enter the land. And then that 11-day journey became even longer because we failed to believe God. So for 40 years, one generation, we wandered from campsite to campsite, from oasis to oasis, waiting for an entire generation to die. If only we could listen to God the first time. If only I would be willing to believe him for what what he has said and trust that despite the obstacles, despite the difficulties, whether it's it's people who seem too strong or, or, or fortified cities that seem impenetrable, that somehow he has a way through what I cannot see clearly. Finally, we came to the borders of the promised land the second time. Off the plains of Moab on the north edge of the sea, the Dead Sea. When Moses had, had passed on, And left me as leader. And God began speaking to me in the similar ways that he'd spoken to Moses. And he said, this day I will distinguish you as a leader among my people. Moses, 40 years before, had led us through the Sea of Reeds. Uh, God called me to lead us through the Jordan River. At flood time, thank you, Lord. That was our first obstacle. And then we were no sooner in the land than we were faced with a fortified city. You know what happened the last time our people were faced with a fortified city. What will you do with this obstacle? What will you do now as you face what seems impossible? God removed the obstacle. I mean, he literally removed it. Like it was no military strategy uh, that anyone ever, ever would have conceived. God was testing me as a leader. Would, would I believe him? Would I, would, I, would I enact this ridiculous plan? Take all the people, march them around Jericho in silence. One time, six days in a row. And then on the seventh day, all the people, all their belongings around the city seven times, and on the final time at the signal, have everyone shout and blow their shofars, their trumpets, for the Lord and for Joshua. And the walls fell down. And we prevailed. We took the city. Such such was what God would call us to. And with faltering steps, sometimes two steps forward and one step backwards, sometimes we would obey. But God was faithful. 31 kings, 31 kingdoms fell. 
as God brought judgment on people who refused to hear him and made way for those he resolved to work through. I I wish 31 kings had been all of them. It was not. Many remained in the land to defy God, to defy God's purposes, to defy God's people. And they would affect my fickle family, and they would falter away from the eternal purposes God had set them towards. But that's a story for another time. Because here we are back at the Jordan River, where God called me to lead the people across, and he went before us. And the water stood up and we walked on dry ground. And out there in the middle of the river are the 12 boulders, one for each of the families of our people. And they've been set there as a memorial calling us to remember. You see, we are prone to forget. And yet God commands us to remember. I am prone to forget. Even when I have seen God do extraordinary things, when my hands have have been party to what God has done, and, and yet a day or two on, a week or two on, a year or two on, and we forget that he he is the God who defies expectations, and, and whether it's, it's water or, or, or neighbors or, or faith or leadership obstacles, God is with us in the midst of it all. You see, the reality is the threats are real. Maybe you'd say it with me. But God is with us. The threats are real, but God is is with us. And so I need to come to this place of remembrance on a regular basis. I need to come and refix my eyes on that which is utterly true because I look into a world and so much is confusing. And so much pretends to be real in defiance against what God declares to be true. And so I have come today to remember. How about you? Joshua, son of Nun. But if you look for my name in Numbers chapter 13, where Moses recorded the names of the 12 who went into the land, you won't find Joshua there. What you find is Husha. Husha. It's a Hebrew word that means salvation. It's a good name. Uh, It's a tough name to live up to. Hey, salvation, how are you doing today? No pressure. But it was while I was still young that Moses recognized that given what we'd been through and what was yet to come, I needed a new name. And so he commissioned me as Yeshua. No longer Husha, salvation, it's now Yeshua, God saves. Specifically, Yahweh saves. And from that point in time, my life, my name would point to the one who was anticipated, who saves. Yeshua, call his name Yeshua, Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. He wants to give you his name as well. We are those people whom look, who look to the one who saves, not by our strength, not by our creativity, not by our resources or our talent or anything else that we might put our, our, our trust in. Those would be little gods and they will fail us. But God is with us. It's the big but of God. He makes everything different. 
when he is with his people. My life points to him because I need him. I live in a world that is, is immersed in sin. Disobedience, insolence, self-will, pride, arrogance, self-importance, violence against self, violence against others, sin. I've seen it all, and I've participated in far too much of it. But God has made a way through the difficulties, through the impossibilities, including the way for us to be right with him. And as I look and see my memorial in the Jordan once again, I see that you too have been given a place of remembrance. A monument that calls us to to regard what God has done. He's crazed another Ebenezer, a memorial stone. You see, isn't it just like God? He leverages my story to anticipate another Yeshua, and he wants to do the same for you, to leverage your story, that his greatness would be seen constantly. And he is the God who provides, who not only calls us to remember, but invites us on a regular basis to do so via the means that he has provided. And so, so we look to him as the God who provides, whether it's water issues or neighbor issues or, or, or political infighting. Whether it's economic distress or, or COVID-19, he calls us to look to him as the God who provides. What, what are the issues that, that you face today that would call, cause, cause you to doubt, that would call you away to put your faith and trust in, in little gods? The threats are real, but God is with us.